In this lecture we'll be taking a look at the upper extremities of the appendicular skeletal system. We'll start in this case with the humerus, we'll move on to the radius and ulna. We'll look at some of the physical features of these bones, talk a little bit about their growth and development, and then take a look at how they connect to the human uh, muscular system. As William Bass points out in his publication, the humerus ossifies from one primary center, the shaft or diaphysis of the bone, and seven secondary centers, three in the proximal or head of the bone, and four in the distal end of the bone. The three epiphyses of the proximal end coalesce about six years after birth, and they fuse with the shaft at about 20 years of age. He also mentions that the humerus is the largest and longest bone in the arm. It articulates proximally with the scapula. The humerus is divided into a shaft and a proximal extremity with a head, neck, and two tubercles. And we'll be going over those and looking at it in both its uh, anterior and posterior aspects. So the upper extremities, uh, this portion of the appendicular uh, skeletal structure that we're looking at in this lecture uh, consists approximately of 60 bones. Uh, each upper extremity includes a humerus, which we'll be starting out with in the arm, ulna, radius in the forearm, then we have carpals, these are our wrist bones, those are regular bones that we took a look at uh, earlier in the lecture series, metacarpals, uh, palm bones, and then phalanges in the fingers of the hand. As I said, though, in this lecture, we're going to focus more on the long bones of these upper extremities. The humerus, or arm bone, is the longest and largest bone of the upper extremity. It articulates proximally with the scapula and distally in the elbow with both the ulna and radius, as I mentioned. The proximal end of the humerus consists of a head, and this articulates with that glenoid cavity of the scapula. And we know that the glenoid cavity is very important when we're estimating sex within the human species. The overall uh, height of the humoral head is also something that uh, corresponds uh, to sex, just because these two phenomena within the skeletal system are so closely linked with one another. As you see when you start to look at some of the additional uh, landmarks of the bone structure itself, there is an anatomical neck, which is an oblique groove, just distal to the head, and it is the site of the epiphyseal plate, or growth plate, for this particular long bone. We find also the greater tubercle. Uh, this is a lateral projection. Uh, it is also projecting uh, distally uh, as it relates to the head. It is the most laterally palpable bony kind of landmark that we would associate with the shoulder. So as you uh, kind of physically uh, palpitate this particular area of the shoulder, uh, the greater tubercle is that aspect of the more mobile uh, or flexible upper arm bone of the upper extremity that you're able uh, to palpitate. The lesser tubercle is an anterior projection and between these tubercle runs an intertubicular sulcus uh, or a uh, bicipital groove but uh, I have listed here an inter intertubercle sulcus. There is then another important landmark known as the surgical neck it's a constricted portion, just distal to the tubercles. It is named this because of its uh, liability to fracture. So this is a very common kind of fracturing point uh, in this proximal end of the bone itself, this surgical neck. Then as your eyes move down uh, along uh, the diagram and you start looking at kind of the central area of uh, the diagram, and we'll be looking at this a little more closely as we will look at some of the associated muscle structures. The body or the shaft of the humerus is generally cylindrical in nature. Uh, it is most cylindrical at its proximal end, and then it gradually becomes more triangular uh, and flattened, and in, 
this case broad as well as it's moving uh, from that kind of proximal area of the diaphysis to the more distal uh, aspect of the diaphysis or the shaft of the bone itself. There is a rough kind of V-shaped area called the deltoid tuberosity uh, which you can see identified uh, in that lateral aspect of uh, the bone structure itself and again based upon its name it is something uh, very importantly connected to the deltoid muscle group. When we look at the distal end of the humerus uh, we have a number of landmarks that become important. This capitulum uh, is a rounded knob that articulates with the head of the radius so make sure to take a look at where the capitulum is generally located. The radial fossa is a depression which receives the head of the radius when the forearm is flexed. So as you are flexing your forearm, as you're moving it or closing that angle, you're moving it toward, uh, in this case, the anterior portion of your body or even toward the trunk, the radius, in a sense, is articulating with that radial fossa of the capitulum. The trochlea is a pulley-like surface that articulates with the ulna. So that gives you an idea of where the articulation with the radius occurs and when, where we see the same kind of articulation with the ulna. But they do articulate a little bit differently with the distal end of the humerus, um, one to the other. So again, to situate the bone uh, in the image and then to relate to the kind of orientation of the bone in the body, you have to take a look at where that trochlea is. Again, it extends a little more distally uh, in that distal region. Then the capitulum, uh, just proximal or in a superior area in correct anatomical position to the capitulum, you not only have that lateral epicondyle, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but then you have that radial fossa, which is important when we have the flexing of the arm itself. So again, the idea of lateral and medial are things that uh, will be definitely part of the various landmarks that we associate with the bone itself. And I would say that uh, of all aspects of this long bone, the distal end is going to be the one that, in a sense, uh, helps the most with siding just because of the architecture that's associated at least uh, with the trochlea and the articulating ulna. The coronoid fossa then appears on the proximal side of the bone itself. It's an anterior depression and it receives the ulna when the forearm is being again flexed. So when you have flexure in the forearm is when you see these various fossa uh, being um, important to how the two bones of the lower arm are articulating and interacting with the single bone of the upper arm. Now in primatology or in the primate record we realize that this architecture is extremely important. Having two bones of the lower arm, single bone of the upper arm, and then the overall architecture of the extremity itself, both left and right, is something that is very unique to uh, living primates. And it's something that, in this case, paleoanthropologists use to help to verify uh, not only the use and the biomechanics associated with the upper extremities, but whether or not the bone fragments they're looking at or the fossilized fragments that they're looking at in the field are, in this case, primatological or not. The Olecranon fossa is another important depression. It is, again, posterior and receives the Olecranon of the ulna when the forearm is extended. So when we take a look at that posterior aspect of the distal end of the humerus, we realize that a lot of the architecture is associated with uh, the movement of the ulna, this hinge-like kind of extension or flexion of the forearm itself. 
And we'll, we'll see that on the lateral and medial aspects of this bone is where we start to see a lot of the associated muscles, not only with the forearm, but also with uh, the flexure and extension of the digits themselves of the lower extremity. The medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle are rough projections on either side of the distal end. And why are they important? Well, as I said before, their architecture uh, and how pronounced they are, and the, the medial epicondyle is the one that you'll be able to uh, palpate uh, more readily than the lateral. These are very important for muscle attachments. So the tendons that are associated with uh, a lot of the superficial and deep muscles of the forearm, as well as the biomechanics of the rotation of the forearm, the extension and flexion of the forearm as it relates to the upper portion of the upper extremity, and then of course the movement of the wrist and of the fingers, a lot of these will in a sense uh, connect with the lateral and medial epicondyles. And of the two, I would say the medial epicondyle, just because of its size, is the one that is uh, most easiest to uh, palpate, uh, to be able to feel where this condyle is. And to a lesser extent, and this is one of the things that uh, gives uh, the humerus its, its name of striking one's funny bone, uh, in this case, the, ul the ulnar nerve. Uh, it lies posterior uh, to the medial epicondyle, and this is an area where sometimes we can um, strike it or, or activate it physically, uh, and that can be a very uncomfortable kind of feeling. Now, many of the measurements that William Bass describes uh, in his work having to do with the upper arm has a lot to do with the growth and development that I mentioned uh, before. The Humerus is one particular bone that can be used to estimate stature, but it is not as reliable as what we see in terms of the long bones of the lower extremities, um, probably the most important of which is the tibia in terms of giving us a very reasonable and safe estimate of height. Um, however, with that said, I would mention that the humerus, with the exception of the humoral head, uh, is a much more species-specific bone in the sense that we do not see as much ethnic, racial, or geographic variation in many of its measurements. Um, this is something we do see with a variety of other bones within the skeletal system, even those that are more reliable when it comes to estimating stature from a, a forensic standpoint. So in terms of what William Bass is identifying with regard to measurements of the humerus, generally the uh, research having to do with this bone will incorporate the maximum length, uh, the maximum length of bone in this case, and that is something that is uh, somewhat challenging to accurately measure. And the reason for that has to do with, in this case, uh, the architecture of that distal end. Remember that the capitulum and the trochlea are not going to be sitting at the same angle, uh, and so you have to orientate them accordingly to be able to uh, arrive at that maximum length. The diameter or mid-shaft is another important measurement, but as I mentioned before, when you're moving from the proximal end to the distal end of the bone, along that mid-shaft or along that shaft, um, the upper portion is, is fairly um, cylindrical. You get to the deltoid tuberosity, it starts to, after that, um, become a little more geometric uh, in the sense of becoming more triangular and then becoming almost uh, flattened as you move to the distal end. So you have to be very, very careful. At the mid shaft, that um, measurement usually taken with sliding calipers is something that's uh, that's fairly reliable when we are trying to make um, group comparison within uh, skeletal samples. The maximum diameter of the head, as I mentioned before, is important just because this is another area uh, where uh, a forensic lens can be applied to the bone. Uh, you can use the maximum diameter of the head to be able to estimate sex. And then in terms of how we use some of these, 
measurements. Um, the most reliable of the measurements is this robusticity index, which basically is a, a, a measurement that compares. So an index, remember, is going to be more of a uh, non-scalar numeric expression that will tell us something about uh, how one shape or size relates to another from one individual to the next or from one group or population to the next. So the robusticity index that is used to um, closely examine the humerus will take a look at the circumference of the shaft itself, the least circumference, and they will then compare this to the maximum length of the humerus. So really what the robusticity index is doing is it's expressing the relative size of the overall shaft of the bone. And that makes sense in the sense that some of the large uh, muscles associated with gross movement and muscles that are associated with the overall architecture of the shoulder itself or of the size of the individual, um, again, can be tied to, uh, in this case mathematically, to the uh, mid-shaft of the humerus. There are a number of muscles that are associated with movement of the arm. In this case, nine muscles across the shoulder joint. Uh, two of them are associated with, in this case, the thorax of the body. Uh, and two muscles are, in a sense, considered to be axial uh, kinds of muscles, which we'll be talking about. And then we have the scapular muscles as well. Um, and so I will highlight in this case three major muscles associated with, in this case, the upper portion of the arm itself. And we'll start with uh, the two that uh, are connected to the thorax. So the pectoralis major uh, is an important muscle to associate with, in this case, um, the humerus. The origin is going to be associated with the clavicle the sternum, and the cartilage of the second to sixth rib. Whereas, in this case, the insertion, which again is uh, associated more with the action of this portion of the body, the insertion is going to be associated with the greater tubercle of the humerus in this case. And so that becomes uh, an important area to focus on. The the pectoralis major uh, and its um, association with flexing, abducting, and then of course rotating the arm in a medial fashion. Another major axial muscle that we would want to associate with uh, at least the, the, the uh, proximal end of the humerus is the uh, latissimus dorsi. Now we've looked at the latissimus dorsi before, but again, in terms of its connection with the humerus, the insertion becomes very, very important. So the origin, which we've talked about before, this will associate with the spines of the lower six thoracic vertebrae, uh, the lumbar vertebrae, and the crests of the sacrum and the ilium. However, the insertion, again, that portion of the attachment that is going to be much more mobile, this is associated with that intertubricular sulcus of the humerus. And what is this doing? So when it inserts with the intertubricular sulcus of the humerus, it is involved in the action of extending, abducting, and rotating the arm, again, medially. So there we see two particular actions which are somewhat different but also very similar in the sense that it has this connection to rotating the arm in that medial fashion or rotating the arm toward the midline of the body. The pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi. But in this case, in both of these major axial muscles, it is the um, interaction with the humerus in an insertion that connects them to the biomechanics of how this bone will operate in the human model. 
in terms of then the scapular muscles that we can connect to in some way shape or form the architecture of the humerus we can focus on that deltoid group so the deltoid muscle it's a very triangular kind of appearing muscle um, its origin is the chromial extremity of the clavicle and the acromium and the spine of the scapula so it it kind of is superior and anterior but then also it wraps over the top and connects to the spine of the scapula where does it then connect with the humerus well again it's in its insertion that it becomes important to the architecture of the humerus in this case it the deltoid is going to connect or insert with the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus so let's just pause there for a moment and I'll mention the action in just a moment when you're talking about a scapular muscle like the deltoid muscle you're talking about a muscle that very much is akin to the demands the biomechanical demands that uh, the human places on the upper arm and when you're talking about the deltoid muscle itself its attachment with the humerus and how we assess robusticity become interlinked with one another the overall size of an individual is mathematically a condition of not the only condition but it is a condition of many things including the deltoid muscle itself and so when we're assessing uh, that deltoid tuberosity and we're doing some of those mid shaft measurements and creating these indices again the attachment of the of the deltoid muscle along that mid shaft becomes a very important measurement and a very important landmark in this assessment so what does the deltoid do in a sense well it adducts flexes extends and medially and laterally rotates the arm so it has a really a very comprehensive duty in terms of the action of the deltoid model it adducts it flexes it extends and medially and laterally rotates the arm and where does it insert the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus and there's your connection so right off the top here we've got three very very important muscles that are to be associated with this particular long bone we have the pectoralis major flexing adducting and rotating in a medial fashion the arm itself the latissimus dorsi this large superficial muscle that's associated with extending adducting and rotating the arm medially and then we have the deltoid group which wraps over the top that kind of triangular muscle which is associated with probably the greatest breadth of actions the adduction the flexion the extension and the medial and lateral rotation of the arm itself another scapular muscle which becomes important for understanding kind of the biomechanics of this area of our anatomy and physiology is the subscapularis the subscapularis has an origin with the scapula of course making it a scapular muscle the subscapular fossa of the scapula is where we see that origin occurring but in terms of its connection with the humerus it's the lesser tubercle of the humerus where we see the insertion occurring for the subscapularis muscle now what is this muscle doing again it is aiding some of these other muscles in a way that is uh, in this case associated with the rotation of the arm and again it's the rotation of the arm in a medial fashion or medially so the subscapularis the lesser tubercle of the humerus and the rotation of that arm in a medial fashion another scapular muscle the teres muscle uh, it's a long and round kind of muscle structure the teres muscle uh, the teres major in this case is the one that we're focusing in on there is a teres minor but we're going to focus on the teres major 
This, uh, in a sense, has an origin along the inferior angle of the scapula. So it is a scapular muscle again. But in terms of what connects it with the humerus, it is its insertion. The teres muscle, in a sense, will insert with the intertubicular sulcus, again, of the humerus. So where the latissimus dorsi is going to insert, the teres major will also insert. What does this do? Well, the teres major helps us to extend our arm. It also assists in the adduction and the medial rotation of the arm. So the teres major helps us to extend our arm. It also assists in the adduction and the medial rotation of the arm itself. Now let's look at a particular kind of muscle which is going to move us into the interaction between the upper portion of the upper extremity and the forearm. And we'll start with, and again we're just focusing on major muscles and those that are important in terms of structure and function and how and through an anthropological lens we uh, attempt to understand uh, skeletal anatomy and how it relates to this biomechanical piece. We'll start with the brachialis. Now this is considered to be a kind of flexor muscle and again associated with that movement of the forearm as it relates to the entire extremity itself. So the origin for the brachialis uh, is the distal anterior surface of the humerus. So when you think about that interior, uh, that entire rather, anterior surface of the humerus and the distal end of the humerus, we see the brachialis uh, attaching, he, attaching here and, and that's where its origin is, that's where its fixed point is in a sense. In terms of the movement, well, again, we're dealing with the lower arm. So we have to start looking at now the, the bones of the lower arm, in this case specifically the ulna. So the insertion for the brachialis, the portion that's going to move the most, uh, is going to be the tuberosity and the coronoid process of the ulna. So when we start looking at the ulna, we will talk about the coronoid process. This coronoid process is where we see the insertion occurring. So what does this allow us to do as human beings? It allows us to flex our forearm. Next we have uh, a particular, again, muscle associated with the movement of the forearm, but one that uh, relates more to extension, so an extensor. In this case, the triceps. Uh, and specifically the triceps brachii is what we uh, will want to associate with, in this case, uh, the humerus. Now, if you've seen a trend here, uh, when we move into the movement of the forearm, the humerus is going to be more associated with an origin than an insertion. And the insertions are going to be associated more with a, the lower two bones uh, of the upper extremity. So in terms of the triceps brachii, or the triceps group as a whole, with the exception of the long head of the group, the lateral and the medial heads of the triceps, the triceps brachii in this case, are going to be associated with that radial groove, and that's going to be the origin. Well, where is the insertion then? As you can imagine, the insertion will be with the lower portion of the upper extremity, in this case the olecranon of the ulna. What does it do? Well, it's an extensor kind of muscle, meaning it extends the forearm, or it extends the arm in a sense. So, triceps brachii, the radial groove of the humerus, that's its origin, and then the olecranon of the ulna, which we'll look at in just a moment, is the insertion. And what does this do? Again, it extends the forearm. All right. Now we have two particular uh, muscles before we move on that will uh, relate again with the movement of the forearm and by their name you can see that they will have different kinds of actions as they relate to the forearm. One's a pronator and one's a supinator. 
Now let me take just a moment uh, to talk a little bit about uh, muscle actions and some of these terms that I'm using on a regular basis because I want to get those in your notes uh, as well. In the previous uh, discussion I talked about uh, flexors and extensors. Uh, these are going to be muscles in the case of a flexor that are going to decrease the angle of a joint. So you think about, in this case, a flexor that is going to bring the forearm up closer to the upper portion of the upper extremity versus an extensor, which is going to increase the angle uh, as it relates to the joint. So if you are going to extend your arm down next to the side of your body, you would be using extensor muscles, or that would be an extensor uh, or an extension as an action. And then if you were bringing the arm up, Again, that's a flexor muscle or flexor muscles that are being utilized in some sort of action in this case. Now we're going to be taking a look at pronation and supination or supination. Um, a pronator muscle is going to turn the palm downward or it's going to move that uh, palmate surface posteriorly. So again, if you were to extend your arm down, you're using extensor muscles. And then if you are, uh, in a sense, rotating that palm and turning it downward or turning it toward kind of uh, the uh, posterior portion of, of your body as you're in a standing position, you're using pronator muscles. Supinator or a supination. A supinator muscle will, in a sense, turn the palm upward or anteriorly. So it's going to be upward, it's going to be moving it toward the anterior surface or in the direction of the anterior surface of the body uh, when you're standing in, let's say, correct anatomical position. So you can see when you're talking about some of the movements associated with uh, the joint surface of the, or the joint of the elbow, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, um, and then the action of the rotation that we're going to be looking at, we've already kind of looked at uh, in some of these muscle functions, these uh, make sense that we would touch upon these as well, the idea of rotating that hand either toward the back of the body or toward the front of the body, or up or down. Let me also just for a moment, as an aside, talk a little bit about the elbow joint itself, because that's important in terms of how we're looking at that forearm and what the what the actions are associated with some of the muscles and what, what the biomechanics of that forearm um, is connected to in a sense. Remember that the elbow joint is a, an area of, of, of junction. It's a, it's a connection between the upper and the lower portions of the forelimb. And basically it's a hinge joint. Um, but there is uh, an interesting piece to this hinge joint because there is a small amount of rotation that is asked uh, of the forearm. So not only are we extending and flexing uh, the lower arm as it relates to the upper arm, but then we're also rotating it, rotating it medially, rotating it laterally. And so a lot of the, well, the design of the joint and then a lot of the muscles associated with the biomechanics of that joint, which it's also a synovial joint, meaning it has um, fluid uh, in and around the joint, these bursa, these sacs of fluid um, that are internal to ligaments and some are external to ligaments. But in a sense, uh, that is the, the joint itself is really uh, accomplishing two tasks. Uh, and the design of the joint reflects that in a sense. So remember, we have those, those tendons, um, which are in a sense associated with the muscles and muscle attachments, both medially and laterally. Uh, and then we uh, have these bony prominences that, in a sense, are uh, attachment sites, uh, the, the epicondyles for those tendons. And then uh, internally and then surrounding that, we have these synovial uh, sacs of fluid, right, these bursa, that, uh, in a sense, uh, prevent any sort of extreme friction or damage to the to the joint. But we know that the elbow uh, does have issues with it. Uh, if you have had an impact injury, let's say, in the elbow, 
uh, maybe a falling injury or something like that. Uh, things like bursitis can set in, where you have this kind of abnormal inflammation of synovial fluid. Uh, you can also have different kinds of tendinitis that can be associated with the elbow joint itself. Um, you know, tennis elbow or golfer's elbow, these are things that will relate to the side uh, of the joint, uh, whether it's the medial side or the lateral side, that has had some sort of injury or uh, damage associated with it. And uh, from an archaeological standpoint, when we start to see agriculture emerging um, globally, we start to see a lot of stress and strain being placed upon uh, the joint surface itself. Most of the stress and strain relates to hinge, the hinge portion of uh, the joint. A lot of the injuries there as well. Not as much of the rotation do we see uh, with regard to things like uh, um, unhealed or partially healed fractures um, or the onset of arthritis in this area or any of these other conditions that I just mentioned and some of the um, skeletal evidence for that. But the, the sense here is that this joint is, is really on the forefront of a lot of the, the labor patterns that are associated with, in this case, agricultural pursuits and uh, the demands that people are putting on the arm itself. So the, the arm, as I said before, you know, from a primatological standpoint, tells us a lot about uh, the unique qualities of the uh, primate skeletal system. Uh, and for evolutionary biologists, this is telling us something about, you know, points of origin and the kind of ecology that can be associated with those developmental forms. Uh, for bioarchaeologists, when we look at qualities of the arm, we see uh, lifeway mapped out on that. We see use wear, we see the demands and the changes in demands that are associated with not only the joint but the arm itself. All right, but let's get back to our last uh, two muscles that I just want to highlight here. Again, there can be many that we can look at, but let's look at a muscle associated with pronation and then one associated with supination. So we have the pronator teres. Uh, this particular muscle here is associated with turning the palm downward or posteriorly. Uh, the origin for this muscle is the medial epicondyle of the humerus uh, and the coronoid process of the ulna. Uh, and then we have, um, in terms of the insertion, the mid-lateral surface of the radius um, so we're going to take a look at the radius here in, in just a little bit, but um, that kind of mid-lateral surface of the radius is going to be the area of, of the greatest amount of movement as it relates to this pronator muscle. And this pronates, again, the forearm it, and the hand, and it flexes also, uh, or it acts to flex the forearm itself. The last one we, hear, uh, we have here is the supinator. The supinator muscle is a is associated with a supinator action or supination. Uh, this again is associated with turning the palm upward or anteriorly. In terms of its origin or that fixed point again, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus uh, is going to be a focal point there. So the humerus there is the anchor, which we've seen that kind of switch. Um, with regard to origin and insertion. And then in terms of the insertion, that more mobile portion of, uh, of the muscle itself, the lateral surface uh, of the radius, the kind of the last uh, third of the radius and at the lateral region of the radius is where we see that uh, supinator muscle attaching. And again, this supinates the forearm and the hand. So I've included these two illustrations to give you uh, the opportunity to look more closely at these various muscles, their locations. Um, again, there's a lot more that can be said regarding the muscle structure uh, of the humerus and the associated bones of the lower portion of the upper extremity and how they interact with one another. But again, we're looking uh, at gross movements and we're looking at things that can be connected to anthropological subjects, uh, structure and function. So if you need to pause uh, the 
lecture at this point. Zoom in on this material and uh, I've included some additional resources on our website that will allow you to uh, really uh, work your way through uh, these diagrams and identify the location of some of these muscles that we've discussed and then of course uh, relate to these muscles in terms of what their uh, origin, insertion, and action would be. Okay, let's get back to the skeletal structure. We'll start with the ulna, uh, and then, uh, of course, we'll take a closer look at uh, the radius as well as part of this lecture. Uh, this graphic here will be blown up on another uh, slide for you, and then, as I said before, there are supplementary materials that you'll be able to look at uh, as you're working your way through this lecture material. The ulna is the medial bone of the forearm. Uh, in other words, it is located at the little finger side of, in this case, uh, the arm itself, at least the lower portion of the arm. The proximal end of the ulna represents, or is uh, best represented, by the olecranon process, uh, which forms the prominence of the elbow itself. So when you are kind of palpitating your elbow and you're feeling the bone structure associated with that, you are ultimately interacting with that olecranon process or the olecranon of the bone. Uh, sometimes when you're making reference or uh, referencing, uh, in this case, um, charts having to do with muscle structures, uh, tendons and ligaments in the area, uh, they will refer to this area as the olecranon. Uh, the coronoid process, which uh, came up in uh, this lecture already, uh, is in an anterior uh, location. It's really the anterior projection. Um, and together with the olecranon, it receives the trochlea of the humerus. The trochlear notch, sometimes referred to as the semilunar notch, uh, is also visible in this image. Uh, it is a curved area between the olecranon and the coronoid process of the ulna. The trochlea of the humerus fits directly into this notch. Then we have the radial notch. Uh, this is a depression located laterally and inferiorly to the trochlear notch, it receives the head of the radius. So where these two begin to interact with one another, um, we recognize this radial notch as being important uh, to that. The distal end of the ulna consists of a head uh, that is separated from the wrist uh, with this kind of uh, fibrocartilaginous disc. And then we have a styloid process, which is at the posterior side uh, of the distal end of the ulna itself. And these features are telling us a lot about how the bone is going to interact not only with the humerus, but also with the radius. And then uh, architecturally, it's telling us something about the design of the wrist and, of course, the design of that hinge joint that we associate with the elbow. The radius, then, is the lateral bone of the forearm. That is, it is situated on the thumb side uh, when we orientate the skeletal remains in correct anatomical position. The proximal end of the radius has that disc-shaped head, which articulates with the radial notch of the ulna. And this disc-shaped head also articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. So it will have um, contact with both bones. 
And then we have a roughened area on the medial side called the radial tuberosity. Uh, this is the point of attachment for the biceps brachii muscle. Um, and so this becomes another important landmark in terms of estimating robusticity and then taking a look at the kind of the demands that are being placed upon uh, the lower and upper portions of the arm. The shaft of the radius uh, will widen distally to form a concave inferior surface that articulates with two bones of the of the wrist that we'll be taking a look at next week. Uh, these bones are the lunate and the scaphoid bones. And then also on the distal end there is a styloid process. It's on the lateral side uh, and then there is uh, a medial concave ulnar notch for articulation with the distal end of the ulna itself. So if you were to consider what various bones are articulating and interacting with the radius, you would of course have to look at both the proximal and distal ends. You would look to the uh, ulna itself, you would look to, uh, in this case, the humerus, and then you would also look to, uh, in this case, uh, the bones of the wrist, at least the lunate, and the scaphoid bones themselves. Not to mention uh, a, an interaction with the ulna on that distal end as well. Uh, the image that you'll be looking at here is in correct anatomical position, which uh, allows you to distinguish both bones. If it was not in correct anatomical position, if you were to rotate, uh, let's say, the thumb toward the midline of the body, these two bones would cross over one another, and so that's why it's important to always look at them in uh, correct anatomical position. And let's let's uh, pause the um, the lecture here for a moment and, and take a look at that. Okay, then in terms of some of the muscles of interest, again, structure, function, and then this ecological piece that we're always focusing in on uh, in anthropological circles, uh, we really have to start out with this uh, triceps brachii. This along with the biceps brachii represent two important muscles uh, to associate with uh, the architecture of the bone. As I said before, when you're taking a look at, uh, in this case, the radius especially, uh, the attachment point, that radial tuberosity, uh, is an important landmark and it is something that is associated with the insertion for that biceps brachii. But the triceps brachii, um, in terms of its insertion, uh, the olecranon of the ulna uh, brings it into our discussion. So it's an extensor muscle. As I said before, it is interacting uh, with, uh, in this case, the humerus, the uh, distal end of the humerus, but then it is interacting in terms of its insertion with the olecranon of the ulna. And unlike the biceps brachii, which is a flexor muscle, the triceps brachii, its action uh, is to extend the forearm or to extend the arm. And that again is to be associated in terms of its gross movement with that olecranon of uh, the ulna itself. That's where that hinging really begins uh, to express itself in terms of the functionality of the bone. The other bone of interest for this lower portion of the arm is the pronator uh, quadratus muscle. So it is a pronator muscle. Uh, the distal end of the shaft of the ulna is its point of origin. So generally the distal end of the shaft, the diaphysis of the ulna, 
is going to be its origin. And then the distal portion or the shaft of the radius is its insertion. So you can really tell that it's a, a smaller uh, muscle and it's again more laterally oriented and it's something that ultimately is important to that rotation uh, in this case. So it pronates uh, it pronates the forearm and hand. So distal shaft of the ulna, distal shaft of the radius, pronation, forearm, and hand. And then just generally speaking here, when you think about the architecture of the lower portion of the upper extremities, and I should uh, again add a little bit to uh, this slide, um, it would include both extensor and flexor in terms of what I'm discussing at this point. The superficial and deep muscles that are in a sense associated with the radius and ulna and are important to extension and flexion, these are going to be the ones that we're really going to focus in on uh, very closely and they will in a sense be I would say directly or indirectly depending on how you look at um, behavior and the functionality of the skeletal system, they are very important to the architecture and the interaction uh, between the radius and the ulna and then of course uh, between the bones that surround it. With regard to the flexor muscles themselves, again uh, the epicondyles of the humerus, the uh, posterior borders of the ulna and of course uh, the radius themselves become important attachment points uh, for this as well. Uh, this is especially the case with the deeper muscles that are associated with uh, the uh, flexion of the arm itself. Uh, we see again the origin as being important to this. Uh, deep flexor muscles, even uh, associated with the movements of the digits, will have origins associated with both the ulna and the radius, and then of course uh, they will uh, insert at the base of uh, distal phalanges and be associated with the movement of the digits. So again, important areas to consider or to at least have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about the architecture of these two bones and then how they, uh, in terms of origins for muscles, will interact with the movement of the digits. Uh, so how these two bones through the muscle structure are going to interact with the movement of the digits. And again, in the primatological model, uh, we are ambidextrous and we have very finite movements that are associated with our digits. And these are things that have proven important to uh, not only a primate ecolo ecology, but also a human ecology uh, as well.